reprinted separately from what I have just commented on, if there's no objection. Without objection. Uh, I want to thank Senator Coons for his leadership in the manufacturing initiative area that he has spearheaded and speak today on a particular measure that will help manufacturers grow and invest. The Manufacturing Reinvestment Accounts Act. This legislation was sponsored by my colleague from Connecticut, co-sponsored by Senator Murphy, as well as sponsored in the House by another Connecticut colleague, Rosa DeLora, to create a new type of account that manufacturers can use to help save and eventually make investments in their businesses. I am proud that the Manufacturing Reinvestments Account Act is part of the Senate Manufacturing American Jobs Agenda, led by Senator Coons. And under this initiative, several of my colleagues have come together to make sure that we move away from manufacturing crises and toward manufacturing jobs. That's what we should be doing, is helping to create jobs, not create crises, especially when they result in self-inflicted wounds. And this bill will allow manufacturers to put up $500,000 a year in these special manufacturing reinvestment accounts, much like people put away money in IRAs. It would give them seven years to use the money they deposit for qualified manufacturing expenses. And so essentially, these manufacturers can use these funds for investments in physical capital, such as equipment or new facilities, or human capital, such as job training and workforce development. And they then would be able to withdraw the funds from their accounts at a low 15% tax rate. This bill is a Connecticut original. I'm very proud that I sponsored it last session. I'm proud to do so again now. And I want to thank in particular Jamie Scott of Air Handling Systems in Woodbridge, Connecticut for the key role he played in developing this idea. He came to me with the basic concept and we developed it into a bill which is so eminently qualified for support. It makes such clear common sense and it shows what happens when industry leaders and their elected representatives work together to devise innovative ideas to grow the economy. They not only make things in Connecticut and make the best manufactured products in the world, but they also make ideas, which is why this Yankee ingenuity has produced a bill that favors reinvestment accounts to enable investment at low tax rates and spur and incentivize job creation. With the support of Mr. Scott and Congresswoman DeLauro, uh, it's been reintroduced on the House side. And I've been happy to lead this legislation in the Senate. I hope it will provide real encouragement for manufacturers to grow and invest and expand job training. Taking this money from profits, putting it away so that it can be saved without taxation, and then using it at lower rates of taxation is a basic principle that makes eminent good sense. And I think it comes at an important time as we all grapple, economists, experts, business people, with how to recognize and spur a manufacturing renaissance throughout the United States. What's needed is dollars and capital and the commitment to make sure we create jobs and use people for those jobs who are not only willing but eager to work. And I also want to thank our community colleges, Asnuntuck and uh, others around the state that have done so much to provide job training in the skills that are needed, matching the skills to the jobs that exist and the jobs that will be created. As Nuntuck Community College's Manufacturing Technology Program, just as one example 
among all our community colleges, has trained more than 1,000 students, and they've transitioned successfully to private sector's job that make use of the cutting edge skills they learn on machinery, often donated by businesses, so that Asnantuck can teach those skills and so that they can be matched to those businesses' needs. I've seen their students in action during my visits to Delta Industry in East Granby and ATI Stowe Machining in Windsor. Both these companies have hired many employees from Asnantuck and we're looking to hire more as they grow and expand in Connecticut. So these programs serve a profoundly important public good for our whole country. They should bring us together on a bipartisan basis. We want to do things together, not divide ourselves over false crises and unnecessary partisan divisions. I'm confident if we pass this legislation, our manufacturers will use this innovative tool and that the manufacturing reinvestment account will help us to double down on growing America. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Clerk will call the roll. Oh, Tim McKinney. He didn't say absence of the call. Okay. I suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Waiting for further debate on the Senate floor on ENDA legislation, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. We are expecting amendment debate to happen and possible final passage sometime this week. While we're waiting for further debate, earlier this morning on Washington Journal, we spoke with a, a person from the Human Rights Campaign who has an interest in the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. Excuse me, His name is Brian Moulton. He joined us on Washington Journal. A strong bipartisan vote uh, on this bill because it's a it's an issue that is uh, supported by people across party lines. It has very large support uh, among the the public, uh, including among Republicans. Uh, and it really needs. Uh, we really wanted to see a vote that reflected the reality of what the American people think uh, about these important protections, and that is that they broadly support them. So it's hugely important for us in advancing this issue uh, in the Senate, and as we look uh, on to the House uh, and, and to the future of this legislation, to see it you know, supported across party lines. This really is not a question of party ideology. This is 
a, a question of basic fundamental American values around fairness, around the golden rule, uh, and that's what we really saw reflected last night with that strong vote. Uh, Speaker Boehner says that not to expect a <laughs> similar vote in the House. Yes, I mean, it's unfortunate the Speaker has decided already uh, to, to step out and, and speak out against uh, considering the legislation. Again, because it is so strongly supported, that's not reflecting uh, where his constituents or the, the American people are broadly. Uh, and frankly, um, it, the bill deserves its consideration in, in both chambers. I think uh, given the opportunity, you'd see a lot of House Republicans support this bill. Uh, when it was on the floor in the House in 2007, 35 members of the Republican Party uh, voted to support passage. Uh, and they should be given that opportunity again. Uh, the Senate votes to advance the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, our topic for our first segment this morning. Here's Billy from Miami, Florida on our independent line for our guest, Brian Moulton of the Human Rights Campaign. Good morning. Good morning, Pedro. Good morning, Brian. First of all, let me say, Brian, you do a fabulous job. We're very, very proud of you. I'm in Miami. I go back to the Bob Coons fighting Anita Bryan. Uh, my first question is, how did we get from GLBT to LGBTQ now. And uh, again, uh, you would think that this end up would be a natural thing. Nobody should discriminate against anything. You do a great job, guy. I'm going to listen offline. Have a good morning. Great. Well, thank you very much. Well, certainly, you know, the, as the, the movement has progressed, you know, the, the way we uh, try to be inclusive of everyone we're representing has, has changed a little bit. Um, but at, at its core, you know, we really are talking about uh, people who are facing unfair treatment uh, in, a, in a host of different areas because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity. And, uh, and those core uh, uh, issues are at the at the, the center of the protections in ENDA and many of the other uh, pieces of legislation that we advocate for. So uh, regardless of sort of the acronym, that is really what we're, we're still working to advance. Uh, Bruce from Baltimore, Maryland. Independent line, good morning. Yeah, uh, so I'm listening to this, and let me say this. All my life, I've always been against anybody who would treat anybody because they're different. Whatever the sexual orientation, I don't really care. I don't really care. It doesn't bother me. I'm not offended by it. I've, had, I've worked with people that were gay or lesbian, and that doesn't bother me. But it's got ridiculous how far you guys have taken this. Let me make one other statement that's important about this. In Baltimore, there's a grocery store. I'm not going to mention it. When you sign up... When you, when you would sign a paper application, it said that they could fire you at will for anything. It means they could fire you for whatever your, your political views are. What, if, if some supervisor doesn't like you, they could fire you for anything. That's what has to be addressed. This has gotten ridiculous. I don't think anybody should discriminate against anybody. But it's gotten to the point now where they're just they're nuts. Well, certainly, you know, we want to make sure that uh, that categories like sexual orientation and gender identity, those those aspects of, of who people are that really have nothing to do with their ability to do a job, are are not things that uh, employers can uh, consider when they're deciding uh, whether to hire or or fire or, or promote uh, someone. And uh, even in a place uh, like Baltimore, uh, your your example where uh, employment at will is the is the general rule. Uh, there's a statewide law uh, in Maryland that prohibits discrimination uh, based on sexual orientation. Uh, it's been there for, for many years, and so employers have a lot of freedom to make decisions about who they, uh, they choose uh, to employ, uh, but not uh, based on uh, discriminatory uh, reasons, and, and in, in Maryland that includes because of someone's sexual orientation. Is gender identity the first time this has been added to the bill? Uh, it has been part of the bill uh, for the last couple of Congresses, but this is the first time that we have seen a chamber uh, advance uh, legislation on the floor that includes gender identity. Does it complicate the issue at all, or at least voting, uh, voting for it? Well, certainly it, uh, it's a new addition to the bill relatively. We've had it for a number of years, but for some uh, senators and, and members, this is the first time that they're voting on, on that issue. We've had a lot of uh, very positive conversations uh, educating people about uh, the discrimination that transgender people face in the workplace. And, uh, and when we do that, people really you know, get it and come along. But certainly new language and, and a new concept requires us to do you know, uh, more uh, lobbying and more education. Uh, and I think you see from the vote last night that, that that has been quite successful. When it comes to the idea of discrimination, how do you define that or how does it get defined? Sure. Well, you know, the bill certainly, um, you know, defines really uh, conditioning, you know, uh, a term or condition of employment uh, on sexual orientation or gender identity, just like Title VII and the ADA um, make those uh, conditions 
uh, or prohibit you know, making those conditions based on uh, other characteristics like race or, or disability. So um, you know, obviously the classic examples are things like refusing you know, someone a job or uh, firing them, refusing to promote them or you know, treating them differently in the workplace. And, and certainly just like uh, under Title VII or the ADA, um, if someone feels that that's what their experience has been, you know, the burden is on them to prove that up uh, in a case um, you know, first through uh, the administrative process with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and, and then potentially in court. So uh, it certainly is not an, an, an easy path, uh, but it, it is recourse uh, for, uh, for perceived uh, discrimination and, and we want to make sure that LGBT people have that sort of opportunity. I was going to ask you, how does that get proven? Though? How do you prove something like that? Well, certainly, you know, you have to, to present evidence that, you know, you've experienced, uh, your, your workplace experience has been uh, different uh, because of your, your uh, one of those characteristics and uh, in many cases unfortunately we still have uh, employers who are very much willing to, to put it in in writing or in in, in a clear uh, language with coworkers that uh, the reason an individual is you know not being hired is being fired is being transferred to that you know less advantageous position uh, is because uh, they are LGBT and uh, and th that's still happening and, and right now in many places even if that does happen that person really has no uh, recourse under law. Is there any protection under the EEOC then? Well, the EEOC has uh, uh, very uh, helpfully advanced uh, the idea that Title VII's sex discrimination uh, prohibition does cover, uh, in many cases, transgender people. Um, and that's a, that's a great step, and we have seen some federal courts also uh, take that position. Uh, but we don't yet have a, a comprehensive and clear protection for transgender people uh, in all cases under Title VII, and, and that's you know, another reason we very much need clarity in, in the law, uh, and, and that brings us that. We've set a line, a set a line for LGBT viewers, 202-585-3883. Here's John from Greensboro, North Carolina. John, go ahead, please. John, are you there? Good morning. One more time for John from Greensboro, North Carolina. Let's move on to Keith. Keith is from Palm Bay, Florida. Hello. Hello. Uh, good morning, guys. Um, you know, I've, I've never really understood these laws. Uh, they seem more of a feel-good thing. Uh, when it comes to business, I don't understand why businesses would discriminate against anybody because it's it hurts their business and sales or hiring people or anything. But since they are a private owned business, I don't see what's wrong with that. What I don't understand about gay people or anybody else that works for somebody, if, if the people you're working for don't like you, why do you want to be there anyway? If, <clears throat> if you're working in a place that, that sets you up for failure, I don't understand. It, when you're getting into a career, you want to love what you do and you want to love where you work. Why would you want to work for somebody that's going to discriminate you, against you? It, well, you know, I think it, it's a it's a very good question. I mean, the 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 reason you know we we have laws, um, you know, and existing laws like Title VII that's been there. Uh, since 1964 uh, is because we have collectively decided uh, as a matter of public policy that there are certain characteristics of individuals um, in many cases that have historically um, subjected them to discrimination in a range of different areas that, that those should not be permissible reasons even in private business uh, to make employment decisions that really at, at its core this, this bill and, and those laws before it are about um, the golden rule and about um, Treating people as you would want to be treated, uh, including an, em an employment. And uh, to your point about why would a you know a gay or transgender person work in a want to work in an environment where there was hostility against them? Well, certainly I can't imagine those individuals do want to do that. But you have to consider you know people who work perhaps in a in a smaller town or in a particular industry where their opportunities for employment are are limited, um, or the the right job for them to advance in a career as, is at a at a at a certain organization in a, in a certain position, and uh, and they should have the equal opportunity to advance. Uh, just like any of their other co-workers uh, without regard to something that has nothing to do with their ability to do that job. On our Democrats line at LGBT viewer, Charlie from New Jersey. Charlie, good morning. Yes, good morning. My name is Charlie. Um, uh, I'm a transgendered person. And a male transgendered person, it's a very difficult position to be in. You need to work. I mean, there's a question as to why would you work there? Well, you need to eat. We need to eat, too. We are humans. Um, and as a human needing to eat, 
uh, I have to go to work. Now, when I go to work and my fingernails change color and I start painting them and I start on hormone replacement therapy and my breasts start to grow and my face starts to soften and I get electrolysis and my beard disappears and I become a woman. Now, if I went for employment as a woman when I started, people would see me as a woman. But since I'm changing, suddenly it throws me into a position where I'm extremely vulnerable. Some of the largest companies have anti-discrimination policies and they'll look after us and they'll make sure that and if you go you go to your you're a head person you talk to them my first employer was gay and I didn't know he was gay it took six months for me to know when I worked for him that he was gay gay doesn't show trans shows it shows in a way that nobody seems to understand so there's a huge discrimination against us plus who's going to use the ladies room do I have to go into the men's room? Because Charlie, Char I, I'm trans. Well, Charlie, we'll yes. let our guests respond. Well, Charlie, thank, thank you. you. You know, thank you very much for calling in and for for sharing your experience. And you know, it really highlights that um, transgender people um, really do experience some of the most uh, severe discrimination in in the workplace in our community. Um, just simply trying to be um, who they are and, and true to themselves as as they present in the workplace. And um, you know, I. I'm sure Charlie's uh, qualifications uh, for her job didn't suddenly change when she uh, began to transition, uh, and, and that really is, you know, why this legislation is, is so important. And I just want to touch on, a, you know, another point that she raised, which is um, this really has become increasingly um, the standard practice in, in corporate America, particularly among large companies, um, because they view it as the right thing to do and the way to retain uh, the best employees. And um, you know, we have almost 90% of Fortune 500 companies that include sexual orientation. Um, call be lifted. Without objection. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that I speak in morning business uh, as in morning business for 10 minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, earlier this year, a man named William, who is from Gig Harbor, Washington, my home state, wrote to me to express his frustration with what he saw happening here in Congress. William served in the Navy and he now works for a tech company that supports Navy communications in the Pacific Northwest. And like so many Americans in recent years, he has witnessed hiring freezes and cutbacks and furloughs and layoffs. He said a couple years ago he was hoping for a promotion, but now he considers himself just lucky to have a job. And he's not even sure how long he can count on that. Well, Mr. President, William's not alone. The partisanship and the gridlock here in Washington, D.C., has been devastating for families just like his in my home state of Washington and across the country. The government shutdown and the debt limit brinksmanship last month were just the latest examples. But Congress has been lurching from crisis to crisis to crisis for years, and it has got to end. So, Mr. President, today I'm going to share a few stories from families who've been paying the price for the dysfunction here in Congress. I've worked very hard to make sure voices like theirs are heard loud and clear in the budget process, and I'm going to keep fighting to make sure their interests are represented every day as we work now towards a balanced and bipartisan budget agreement. Mr. President, seven months ago, the House and the Senate each passed our budgets. The Senate budget that we passed here was built on three principles. First of all, our highest priority was investing in jobs, and economic growth and prosperity that was built from the middle out, not from the top down. Secondly, the deficit has been now cut in half, and we build on the $2.5 trillion in deficit reduction that we have passed now since 2011 to continue to tackle this challenge fairly and responsibly. And third, our budget keeps the promises that we have made to our seniors and our families and our communities. The budget that passed the House reflects different values and priorities, but it was our job to get in a room, make some compromises with them, and find a way to bring those two budgets together. Although I had hoped we could start this bipartisan budget negotiations far sooner and avoided last month's crisis, the budget conference that now has begun, started last week, offers us now the opportunity to break this cycle of gridlock and dysfunction and start moving our country back in the right direction. We have a chance now 
to turn our attention back to where it belongs, strengthening our economy and creating jobs, to continue making responsible spending cuts while closing wasteful tax loopholes that are used by the wealthiest Americans and biggest corporations, and to finally show the American people that Congress can work together we can compromise and alleviate the uncertainty and the pain that families across the country are facing. Mr. President, the effects of these years of gridlock are clear in places like the Denise Louis Education Center in Seattle. I visited that Head Start program earlier this year where pre-K students from low-income families can learn their ABCs and take part in story time and benefit from health and nutrition programs. Even before the major cuts to Head Start that took effect last March, that center had a waiting list. Now, the director of the school has had to drop kids from that program because of these tight budget constraints. And they are far from alone. Another Head Start program in Everett, Washington, a program that served needy kids since the 1970s, had to completely shut its doors this summer because Congress couldn't work together. That one facility alone was helping 40 kids prepare for kindergarten. Nationwide, these cuts have forced tens of thousands of children out of Head Start as well. And that's not all. The senseless cuts from sequestration have impacted education programs all across the country. Researchers and scientists who are working on cures for cancer and other diseases have lost their jobs. Programs like Meals on Wheels that deliver food to seniors have been cut, and there's so much more. The ripples of this so-called sequestration have been held in, felt in our homes, in our businesses, and across our fragile economy. The across-the-board cuts have also had, of course, serious impact on defense programs and workers. Earlier this year, I heard from one of my constituents whose family was impacted by this very directly. His name's Bob. He's from Bremerton, Washington. He's an engineer at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. He told me every day, highly skilled employees come into his office often in tears and tell him they don't know how they are going to manage to make ends meet if they're furloughed or laid off. They're worried now. They've felt the pain for months. They know it could get worse. Because, Mr. President, if these automatic cuts are not replaced in a bipartisan deal, Another $20 billion is scheduled to be cut from defense spending in January, just a few short months from now. That would make more furloughs and layoffs much more likely, and it would mean continued and deeper cuts to combat training. Well, Mr. President, it doesn't have to be this way, because something both Democrats and Republicans agree on is that at the very least, this budget conference should be able to accomplish the absolute minimum is finding a path to replace those terrible sequestration cuts and set a budget level for at least the short term. Republican Congressman Hal Rogers, he's the House Appropriations Committee Chairman, he said sequestration and its unrealistic and ill-conceived discretionary cuts must be brought to an end. Even House Speaker John Painter said the cuts would hollow out our military. And just recently, the House Armed Services Committee Republicans sent me and Chairman Ryan a letter urging us to replace sequestration, saying it was, quote, never intended to be policy. Well, Mr. President, that's exactly right. Sequestration was intended to be so bad it would drive both sides to the table to be willing to make some compromises to replace it with smarter savings. And I'm very glad that more and more of our colleagues from both sides of this aisle are stepping up to try and find a solution. So the question now is not whether we should replace this across the board sequester cuts, but how we do it. The House and the Senate budgets both deal with sequestration, just in different ways. The House budget fully replaces the defense cuts and lifts the BCA cap. They pay for that by cutting even more deeply into key domestic investments. Our Senate budget, on the other hand, replaces all of the automatic cuts and pays for it with an equal mix of responsible spending cuts and revenue that we raise by closing wasteful tax loopholes. 
So, Mr. President, finding a bipartisan solution won't be easy. We all know that. It will require compromise from both sides. And as I mentioned at our first budget committee conference last week, I'm going into this process ready to offer some tough spending cuts that, unlike the sequester caps that disappear in 2022, would be permanently locked into law. I know there are many Republicans who would be very interested in swapping some of the inefficient and damaging cuts from sequestration with structural changes to programs that would save many multiples of the cuts they replace over the coming decades. In short, I'm willing to compromise. I'm ready to listen to Republican ideas. And as long as their proposals are fair for seniors and families, I'm prepared to make some tough concessions to get this deal done. But I can't negotiate by myself. Compromise has to run both ways. That means in addition to the responsible spending cuts, Republicans need to work with us to close wasteful tax loopholes and special interest subsidies because it would be unfair and unacceptable to put the entire burden of deficit reduction on the backs of our seniors and our families. And it shouldn't be difficult for Republicans to agree to put just a few of the most egregious, wasteful loopholes and special interest carve-outs on the table to get a balanced and bipartisan deal? If the choice is between closing a wasteful loophole and lurching to another crisis, I hope every one of my colleagues would put their constituents before special interests. Mr. President, over the last few years, people across the country have lost a great deal of confidence in Congress's ability to work together for the good of our nation. People like Nani King, who, as the New York Times recently reported, serves as a registered nurse at Madigan Army Medical Center in my home state of Washington. During the shutdown last month, she worked without pay. And without a paycheck, she had to dip into her retirement account to make her monthly mortgage payment. Now, even though the shutdown is over, her family can't take any chances. She told the Times, quote, we just have too much to lose. Mr. President, we here in Congress owe it to her family and to families all over this country to work to find a path forward. So let's put an end to this gridlock. Let's put an end to these crises. Let's show the American people we're listening to them. In fact, let's show them that their star stories are more important than sticking to party lines or staying in ideological corners. We've got to rebuild some trust, and we can do that. We need to find a path to compromise. We need to work together to strengthen our economy and create jobs. I'm ready to do that in this budget conference. I'm hopeful that over the coming weeks, every one of my colleagues on that committee will make it clear that they are as well. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. I suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
No votes are scheduled in the Senate today, and there's been no announcement of a deal on amendments to the workplace anti-discrimination bill that's pending before the Senate. A Congressional Quarterly writes that Republicans are proposing amendments to the bill to expand exemptions for religious employers and impose a national right-to-work law and that Democrats are likely to allow votes on those amendments offered by GOP Senators Patrick Toomey of Pennsylvania, Kelly Ayotte of New Jersey, and Rob Portman of Ohio. We're going to hear more about the bill now. Continue with portions of Washington Journal with Brian Moulton with the Human Rights Campaign. Those and, uh, and we really just want to ensure that people who are not uh, so lucky to work at those companies, but um, in many other places in this country, have uh, those same sorts of protections. Uh, speaker Boehner said specifically when it came to the reason he wouldn't bring it to the House, he said the speaker, his spokesperson said the, the speaker believes this legislation will increase frivolous lit litigation, cost American jobs, especially small business jobs. Uh, Heritage Action for America put out a statement on it saying that the vote or the bill would impose liabilities on employers for alleged, quote, discrimination based on subjective, self-disclosed identities and not on objective employee traits. It would not protect equality under the law, but create special privileges that are enforceable against private actors. Sure. Well, first of all, the, 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 the accusation of frivolous lit litigation just isn't borne out by the experience that states and uh, localities and corporate America have with these sorts of protections. Um, we do have 21 states uh, with sexual orientation protections and 17 with gender identity. Uh, and the, the GAO has, uh, in, in, at multiple times, uh, at the request of members of Congress, studied the experience uh, of these states and looked at the litigation. Uh, and there isn't uh, this flood of litigation uh, that, are, that opponents of the bill often cite to. It, just, it is not what has happened. We've seen people file complaints under those laws in a, in a, at a rate that's consistent with the, the, the rate of LGBT people in the, in the population. Uh, and it really has not created uh, the, the, that sort of uh, issue for businesses in these many states uh, that sometimes gets, uh, gets uh, mentioned, including by the, by the speaker's spokesperson. And uh, in response to the heritage piece, um, you know, as you heard Charlie describe just a minute ago, these are not, you know, sort of hidden, uh, self-disclosed, self-identified aspects of, of LGBT people in many cases. If I come to work uh, and put a part, uh, picture of my partner on my desk or someone in my office asks me what I did this weekend and I'm honest with them, um, you know, I am being open about my sexual orientation, and not in a way that's inappropriate in the workplace, but in a way that's the same as what any other employee might do in talking about their family. Uh, and obviously, with Charlie's experience, when she comes to work and, and present changes, uh, you know, her gender presentation in the course of her job, uh, or frankly, if someone uh, she came to work uh, transitioned as a, as a woman, but someone found out about um, her past life in some way, um, those aren't you know those aren't things that you know that Charlie's uh, has inside of her that nobody knows about that she could just keep her head down and, and do her job, those are aspects of who she are that are very evident uh, to her coworkers. And, and so it's very unfair to, to suggest that uh, somehow these are, these are characteristics that uh, an employer is being burdened um, because uh, they can't make employment decisions based on them when we know uh, and the American people believe that they are not related to your ability to do a job or do it well. Brian Moulton of Human Rights Campaign joining us. Mays from Dayton, Ohio, Independent Line. Good morning. Yes, I have a question. When it comes to transgender and the restrooms and different things, it's like they have a family room for people with kids, and then they can just create a, a restroom for transgender people too. So, because everybody don't want to be in the same restroom, bathroom. But when it comes to discrimination and all of this law, this new law y'all want to come up, is it for just only transgender? I mean, just for LBG people? Because some people still like here being discriminated against, and nobody's trying to change the laws for them. And I think you fit up under the same laws that we fit up under, don't you? Or do you not? Well, thank you for the question. Um, you know, the, certainly ENDA, um, the law we're talking about, um, is about sexual orientation and gender identity, um, but many other characteristics are, are already protected under federal law, race, sex, religion, uh, national origin, disability, age. Um, and so there are a lot of remedies already available, both under federal uh, and also under state and local laws for, for, uh, for people who experience discrimination uh, on other uh, bases. So, uh, you know, if, if you know people who are experiencing that, I encourage you to, um, to look at um, those uh, remedies that are available. Um, there's a lot of information out there um, from the EEOC and from state and local agencies as well. Matthew from West Winchester, Virginia, an independent calling in our line that we set aside for LGBT people. 
Uh, Matthew, good morning. Yes, good morning. Uh, I'd, I'd like to first off mention about uh, the caller who talked about why would you work in a place that discriminates? Well, I worked for the place, for a place that dis was the height of discrimination. I was a Navy officer, and I was a Navy officer for 10 years. And what hurt my relationship with my partner was the inability to take my partner to Navy functions, Navy balls. Here I would get dressed up, put on my medals, and... Uh, have to leave him at home, and it, uh, it it certainly soured our relationship. Well, of course, that has now passed. Uh, I'm out of the service. I'm a business owner myself now, and actually 40% of my workforce are LGBT. As a matter of fact, my receptionist is transgender and uh, an absolutely beautiful woman who uh, <laughs> educates me on the other uh, letters that are associated LGBTQ, uh, <laughs> I can't get them all get them all straight. But uh, I I would love to talk to Speaker Boehner uh, and say, as a small business owner, how productive we are uh, as a workforce. We deal with clients day in and day out, and when we bring in a new client, there is no client who asks, "Well, do you hire gay people?" Are gay people going to be handling my accounts? No, they just understand they're going to get the most productive, profitable work out of people who can be themselves, have pictures of their partners on their desks, uh, be able to talk about current economic or current uh, political issues. You know where I'm going with this. And it's, I've seen it, too, in the military, talking with a friend of mine who is still in is gay and is now able to take his partner to the Navy functions, and they look beautiful together. So that's, thank you for this time. That's Matthew from Virginia. Thank you, Matthew, and, and first of all, thank you for, for your service and, uh, and for sharing your experience. Um, certainly, um, I think a, a, a strong uh, reason that you know, members should uh, uh, support ENDA is because we've already seen a tremendous success with this idea uh, in the repeal of the, the so-called don't ask, don't tell uh, law that barred people from serving openly as, as lesbian, gay, or bisexual uh, in our armed forces. That, uh, that law has been now off the books for, for several years, and um, by all accounts, the, uh, the military is still functioning quite well. And now we have uh, individuals like yourself and, and your friend who are able uh, to serve uh, openly and, and not be burdened with um, having to hide who they are and their family uh, in the course uh, of serving our country. So um, I think it's a tremendous example of how not uh, taking something like sexual orientation into account, but just judging people on how well they can do their jobs can be incredibly successful, including in something that's so important uh, to our country, like our national defense. The president wrote about this yesterday in a blog post saying that several Republican senators already voiced support as a member of a number of Republicans in the House. If more members of Congress step up, we can put an end to this form of discrimination once and for all. How much leadership has he shown on this issue? The president has been very supportive, and his administration has uh, been very supportive um, since he came into office. Um, you know, we had our first administration official uh, in many years testify uh, in Congress right after the president took office, uh, a, a member of the EEOC um, speaking in favor of the legislation, and we've seen consistent support from the president uh, since then. And, and you saw, obviously, the op-ed that was published um, from the president. Um, the, the White House put out a statement of administration policy in support of the bill before our, our vote yesterday in the, in the Senate, uh, and they've communicated um, their support you know, over the years in, in all of the ways we've had this bill um, uh, attempted to advance, and, and certainly they've been a, a very valuable partner. The Washington Blade writes about this, and one of the lines from the posting says that much the consternation of LGBT advocates, Mr. Obama has withheld using a heavily sought executive order that would bar federal contractors from engaging LGBT workplace discrimination. Yes, I mean, there's a, another avenue for protecting some LGBT workers, and that would be people who work uh, for companies that do business with the federal government, uh, is to expand an existing executive order um, that prohibits discrimination by federal contractors. It already includes uh, race, sex, uh, religion, et cetera, um, but it does not include sexual orientation and gender identity. Should the president go that route? Absolutely. That is a, absolutely something we would like the president to do. We've been asking him to do for, for many years, um, regardless of what happens with ENDA and we certainly are hopeful that we can be successful in Congress. Uh, it's an important additional protection uh, for individuals.
individuals uh, who work for companies that are you know, taking taxpayer dollars to provide goods and services to the federal government uh, and shouldn't uh, be treating LGBT people differently. You've asked for years. What's been the response? Uh, well, certainly they uh, have not yet done it so, um, and have talked about the importance of ENDA uh, as, a, as, a, as a broader way to address this issue. Which but is as for why they didn't do it yet, what's uh, you know, You'd have to speak to the White House directly about you know, why the president hasn't taken this step. Um, it's certainly something he can do, and we hope he will soon. Right. Brian Moulton from Human Rights Campaign. Our guest, James, is up next. Newport News, Virginia, Democrats line for our line for LGBT viewers. Good morning. James, are you on? Go ahead. Yes, I'm on. I wanted to let, uh, I found the idea of as asking why uh, somebody would want to work somewhere where there's discrimination going on uh, to be a, uh, rather uh, odd question considering the fact that um, people simply need to eat so it doesn't matter. You work where you uh, need to work in order to survive and uh, the bottom line is that um, people should not be discriminated against because of sexual orientation or even any kind of um, transgender issues. Uh, when will the human race ever learn that all people are people, not just the ones we most understand? <laughs> well, thank you, James, and, and you know I obviously agree that um, you know we these are really basic core protections uh, that I think uh, and and frankly the polling has has borne out that um, Americans by and large support, uh, and we simply need to have Congress um, turn that. Um, broad uh, public opinion uh, into reality so that people um, like Charlie that we, we spoke with earlier and, and, uh, and others um, can go to work without fear of losing their jobs simply because of who they are. Uh, Ridge, New York, Republican line. Here's Liz. Good morning, Liz. You're on with Brian Moulton. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I believe that no one should be discriminated for any reason whatsoever. But I was, uh, would like to uh, comment on a comment that was made about the military. Now, the military won't tell you when they have problems with the female and the male and whatever gender is whatever. They won't tell you anything. The government will never, ever reveal anything that's going on. And second of all, if you're hired as a man to do a man's job, meaning physical labor and, and so on, and you turn out to be a female, uh, if, if the person that hired you, I mean, that's, isn't that deceitful, meaning you were hired under the circumstances that you were going to be doing work that you know that you can't do? And third of all, the last thing I want to say is uh, you, you have to understand about people growing up you have different age groups. Uh, some uh, uh, discrimination against, let's say, your sexuality and whatnot. People grew up not involved in that, meaning they were never had access to it. It wasn't. Nobody ever talked about it in the family. Nobody ever said anything. Uh, well, you might come across people that are different religions. They're different sexes. They're different. You weren't taught that. So you have to understand that people, I think it's mostly the older people in life, don't like things pushed on them. They have to get into it gently. You have to, you have to let them get out there and say, okay, these are the changing times, and you have to adjust to it. We'll leave it there, caller. Thanks. Well, you know, certainly to your last point, um, you know, I think... And, and again, you know, we've done a great deal of public opinion polling on this issue. Certainly, um, when it comes to LGBT equality, the support uh, on a range of issues, in, including uh, workplace protections, is, is strongest among uh, younger Americans. But it actually, uh, you know, we see majority support across a whole range of demographics, including age. And, and while, you know, I certainly appreciate that, that some older Americans might not have uh, had as much exposure uh, and maybe don't understand these issues as well. I think they do understand um, quite well this sort of 
basic concept that you should treat people uh, as you'd want to be treated, including in the workplace. And, uh, and I think that's why you see, um, even among that demographic, uh, a majority support for legislation like ENDA that would protect our community in the Ralph, workplace. Ralph Reed is the founder and chairman of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, mm -hmm. wrote about ENDA in a piece for USA Today in which he says it's a dagger aimed at the heart of religious freedom for millions of Americans. The bill's so-called religious exemption is vague and inadequate based on previous court rulings. Faith-based charities may be subject to harassment and junk lawsuits. And like Obamacare's nearly identical religious exemption, which turned out not to protect most faith-based employers, is as porous as Swiss cheese. Well, I, I would, you know, respectfully disagree. Um, the religious exemption uh, in ENDA is quite broad, and it exempts the, the same class of uh, employers that have been exempt uh, under Title VII's prohibition on religious discrimination uh, for 40 years. Is it just uh, churches then? Uh, it is not just churches. It is, um, you know, it is a it is a range of religious organizations, um, and we have seen. Certainly, um, over the last 40 years, um, uh, organizations that you know uh, assert the exemption and they and they have gone to court and, and in many cases prevailed that they are religious entities that get to discriminate based on religion uh, if they so choose. Those same group of employers are going to be able, under ENDA's you know very broad religious exemption, uh, to discriminate based on sexual orientation and gender identity. It's a it's a difficult line that has to be drawn um, uh, with regard to both religious liberty and and the protecting LGBT people. And um, the bill, you know, takes a takes a broad uh, approach uh, at, at exempting those religious organizations. Uh, so I, I, I really don't think that the, the kind of scare tactics that we're hearing about the burden this will place on religious organizations are, are fair. He takes some of the arguments that you actually used in defense of it. He said society doesn't need tutoring by Washington politics on this issue. At least 21 states and hundreds of cities have discrimination ba bans on sexual orientation. And he says more than 80% of Fortune 500 companies have adopted similar policies. So it seems to be taking care of it on the state and at least the business level. He said. Well, well, it's certainly true. We've seen some significant advances, you know, over the last, um, you know, three decades uh, as as states and localities and, and businesses have moved along on this issue. But the reality still is in the majority of this country, those protections don't exist for people. Uh, and uh, w that's simply not acceptable. Um, uh, we should have uh, robust protections against employment discrimination for LGBT people uh, everywhere they live. And they shouldn't have to uh, live in a state that has advanced a protection uh, in order to enjoy them. Because at, at its core, what we know is that these characteristics have nothing to do with your ability to do a job discrimination uh, against uh, these individuals in employment is, is wrong, and the American people agree with that statement, uh, and Congress needs to address it. Fenn is from Jacksonville, Florida, on our independent line for Brian Moulton of the Human Rights Campaign. Good morning. Hello. Thanks for having me. Go okay. ahead. You're on. You're on. Yeah. Um, what I'd like to ask, Brian, is why are we even having this discussion, okay? <laughs> We all know that this bill has absolutely zero chance of passing as long as John Boehner is the speaker and as long as he's a slave to his conservative base and to the Hastert rule. Well, I think, you know, it's important uh, that we take every opportunity to advance these protections through Congress to as far as we can. Um, it's absolutely fair to say that we have a, have a difficult road in front of us in the House of Representatives. The Speaker has, you know, uh, took the opportunity to, to make that clear uh, once again uh, yesterday, but um, we need to continue to find uh, opportunities uh, to try and advance this, uh, even in the House of Representatives where there is uh, so much resistance. But uh, every time we're able to advance this protection, it becomes easier uh, in a future Congress uh, to help get this across the finish line. It was certainly the approach um, that we have taken on, on other protections, including uh, protections uh, against uh, hate violence. Uh, it took many years Mr. and many That's the quorum call be dispensed with. No objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm very proud to be here today speaking in support of historic legislation that will move us one step closer to the day when who you love has absolutely nothing to do with the rights that you are afforded as a citizen of the greatest country in the world. Frankly, the passage of the Employment Non-Discrimination Act is embarrassingly long overdue. In my state of Connecticut, we've had anti-discrimination laws on the books for over 20 years. In 1991, Connecticut actually became the fourth state to formally protect LBGT workplace rights. And in 2011, we became the 15th state to offer similar pro protections to our transgendered citizens.
So it's funny because my constituents assume that, frankly, all across this country, it's already illegal to fire somebody for who they love and for who they are. But of course, as we know, that's just not the case across most of this country. Right now, in some states, you can be fired from your job simply because of having a little photograph of your partner on your desk at work. And while ENDA has been a commonly accepted civil rights protection in my state, you may hear some express opposition to this legislation on this floor by very vaguely citing what are commonly referred to as the concerns of the business community. I'm not sure what businesses they're referring to because in my state we've got some of the biggest and most successful multi-state and multinational businesses in the world. And they know that non-discrimination isn't just the right thing to do, it's also really good for business. Companies like United Technologies and General Electric and Xerox, they want the best and the brightest people to work in an inclusive team environment, not having their employees hiding from each other who they really are. Companies like BI Pharmaceuticals and Aetna, they haven't folded under the weight of having these state-based workplace protections. In fact, they are thriving in Connecticut, across the country, and all across the world. And so in speaking with companies from all over Connecticut, none to me have ever argued that equal protection in Connecticut is something that is holding their businesses back. And frankly, they've been living under this law for decades now. And it's not just Connecticut's largest employers. Connecticut's law actually goes further than ENDA does in prohibiting discrimination even amongst businesses with fewer than 15 employees. Our small business community understands that far from inhibiting commerce, non-discrimination policies actually help make our companies, big and small, stronger. So even though a majority of American businesses oppose employment discrimination, some argue that this legislation is going to harm businesses whose leaders have very strong religious beliefs. However, I think it's important to note, Mr. President, that the religious exemption in this legislation is even broader, remarkably broader, I would argue, than that exemption that's in Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. And it represents, frankly, a compromise that doesn't go as far as some members of this body, including myself, would like. In an op-ed that was published this summer, former head of the NAACP, Julian Bond, equated these religious concerns with the arguments that he heard from opponents of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Here's what Bond wrote. He said, quote, in response to the historic gains of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, opponents argued that their religious beliefs prohibited integration. To be true to their religious beliefs, they argued, they couldn't serve African Americans in their restaurants or accept interracial marriages. Now, it would be shocking to hear somebody make a similar argument today about the treatments of African Americans in our society. And frankly, I think it'll be just as shocking 40 or 50 years from now for people to read that that argument is being made today about the treatment of LBGT Americans. There are, in fact, interesting to point out, numerous Christian and Jewish organizations and denominations that have taken a strong stand in favor of this legislation because they understand that unequal treatment under the law is at odds with their faith. Now others on this floor have argued and have made the argument that passage of ENDA will lead to frivolous lawsuits from fired workers. So let me give you my state's perspective on this. Again, well, we've been living under this law since 1991. And we've had protections that we're debating today for two decades. And we simply haven't seen frivolous lawsuits. And again, we have big companies that employ thousands of people across the state and across the nation. Let me just give you the statistic from 2009 to 2010, which is the most recent year that we have data available. Out of a total of 1,740 employment-based discrimination complaints that were filed in the state that year, only 53 were based on sexual orientation discrimination. As just a means of comparison, 464 complaints were filed based on age discrimination. We went back a number of years, not a single year, over the last 
half a decade that we looked at in which there were more than about 40 or 50 complaints. My state has been a test case for these protections for sexual orientation and gender identity. The parade of horrible consequences that opponents of this bill say will happen just have not happened in Connecticut. And what we're doing here really is pretty simple. We're not trampling on the First Amendment. We're not dictating morality. We're not harming the economy. We're not undermining the religious community. We're just saying that you can't discriminate against people in the workplace because of who they choose to love or who they are inside. The simplicity of this bill is why two-thirds of the American public support it. And it's why I think that 50 years from now, history is going to judge no less harshly those that vote against this act as it judges now those that voted against some of the civil rights acts of the 50s and 60s. Who you love, who you are inside, what you feel, should never ever be a reason for discrimination. Mr. President, I was on the House floor six years ago when the House passed ENDA. And I still remember listening to Congressman Barney Frank's closing argument. He welled up as he was giving it, and there were a lot of tears shed on the floor as well. And I just want to close by quoting what he said. Congressman Frank said this, and I won't try to do his accent. He said, I used to be someone subject to this prejudice. And through luck and circumstance, I got to be a big shot. I am now above that prejudice. But I feel an obligation to 15-year-olds dreading to go to school because of the torment that they endure, to people who fear that they will lose their job at a gas station if somebody finds out who they love. I feel an obligation to use the status that I have been lucky enough to get to help them. And I make a personal appeal to my colleagues. Please don't turn your back on them. We're all big shots here. We've been lucky enough to get elected to the greatest deliberative body in the world. And there is an obligation and a responsibility that comes with the job that we have here to stick up for people who are being discriminated against because of who they are. The greatest moments of this body have been when we have joined together, Republican and Democrat, to stand against that kind of discrimination. And our ability to rise to Congressman Frank's challenge, please don't turn your back on them, can be this week another great chapter in the history of this great body. I yield back the floor. And note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.